Good afternoon. I call this oversight hearing to order as this committee well knows one of the fundamental trust and treaty obligations to tribal nations is to protect the public safety on their lands. As early as the 19th century and as recently as 2022, Congress has affirmed and reaffirmed this obligation from the General Crimes Act of 1817 to the Tribal Law and Order Act of 2020, or 2010, excuse me, and even more recently with the Savannah's Act, the Not Invisible Act, and the reauthorization of the Violence Against Women Act, we have recommitted and doubled down on our obligation. And yet it's abundantly clear that public safety challenges persist. The committee's record is filled with examples of these challenges, inadequate federal funding and public safety resources, including law enforcement and corrections personnel, patchwork criminal jurisdiction, deteriorating and unsafe jails, or sometimes no jails at all, the crisis of missing and murdered indigenous people, and the devastating impacts of fentanyl, just to name a few. And with an evolving legal landscape, most notably with the Supreme Court's decision in McGirt, these resource-based challenges have become more acute. So when the committee received renewed calls to focus on public safety matters, we answered. First with our listening session in March when over 600 individuals listened in and commenters overwhelmingly listed MMIP and law enforcement officer recruitment and retention challenges as top priorities. Second, with our legislative hearing earlier this month on two bipartisan bills that would address both these priorities in meaningful ways. And today with our oversight hearing, we'll hear from federal witnesses whose agencies are directly responsible for ensuring public safety and providing victim services in native communities. In short, this oversight hearing has been purposefully informed by priorities that tribal leaders and native stakeholders uplifted in our listening session and legislative hearing. It gives the DOI, Justice, and HHS the chance to respond and testify about how they are addressing unmet public safety needs and implementing the laws that Congress passed to address those needs. It's also the committee's opportunities to remind our executive branch partners that the United States must do everything it can to live up to the trust and treaty responsibility to protect the public safety of American Indians, Alaska Natives, and Native Hawaiians. Before I turn to Vice Chair Murkowski for her opening statement, I'd like to thank all of our witnesses for joining us today. Vice Chair Murkowski. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and welcome to, to our witnesses. Um, I really appreciate that we're having this oversight hearing today. Uh, I think it is one of those areas that, um, regardless of, of the part of the country that you're from or your political party, this is this is something that we all care deeply about. I'm honored to have worked with Native leaders in Alaska and across the nation over multiple Congresses on these issues of public safety. This committee has been a great forum to both shed light on the need to improve public safety and justice in Native communities and also taking concrete steps to address the problem. We saw that through, through passage of VAWA 2022, which included the tribal title that we authored. My thanks to the Alaska Native Women's Resource Center, the Alaska Native Justice Center, the Alaska Federation of Natives, and so many other powerful advocates who have partnered with us on solutions. Through listening to tribal leaders and advocates, we've learned how a lack of resources combined with jurisdictional complexities have contributed to a crisis of missing and murdered indigenous people and a disproportionately high rate of victimization. And based on this record and testimony, I think we've seen some real concrete steps to empower tribes to strengthen their own justice systems, both for changing law and increasing federal resources. Tribes in PL 280 states have been calling for more support for tribal courts and law enforcement for years, even, even decades now. Uh, about a decade ago, the Indian Law and Order Commission issued its report, which confirmed what we all, what all of us already knew, and that was federal investment in tribal justice for PL 280 states is more limited than elsewhere in Indian country. So in 2015, uh, we directed BIA and DOJ to report on the budgetary needs of tribal courts in these states. Uh, we were able to follow up with funding in the next year, appropriated 10 million for tribal courts in PL 280 states. And since then, we've continued to build on that support uh, in the FY24 interior spending bill. Uh, we now have it at $21 million. This year, I was also able to include some language that directs BIA to conduct consultation on the budgetary needs in PL 280 states for tribal law enforcement. 
uh, as well as well as courts and other judicial needs, and then to report back on available funding, uh, whether that's at DOI or elsewhere. And this all takes time, this is work, um, but know that there's so many of us that are really committed to keeping that momentum going. In Alaska, we all know the need for additional law enforcement and justice systems is so great. As many as one in three native villages lack any law enforcement presence at all. Recognizing that there's no better way to understand the impact of these unique challenges than to visit in person. I've hosted two U.S. Attorneys General up to Alaska to see the impacts of these challenges on the ground. So whether you're in, in Bethel, Napakiak, Napaskiak, Galena, Hoosley, or Anchorage, everyone deserves to live in a safe community. But we need the commitment of our federal partners. And again, in this area, I think we're making some progress. Uh, last Congress, there were many of us here uh, uh, who helped to author and negotiate VAWA 22. Um, as part of that, I was able to include the Alaska Tribal Public Safety Empowerment Act. And this pilot project supplements the work that the state of Alaska is doing with regards to public safety. It was an Alaska-specific solution in that it did not create any new Indian country, nor did it take away any jurisdiction from the state. But now we're in this, this critical moment where tribes have the chance to implement some of these newly affirmed authorities. The Alaska Intertribal Working Group met just a couple weeks ago in Fairbanks for the very first time. So I want to thank everyone who is working on those efforts. Uh, when we were thinking about how Alaska could be included as part of VAWA 22, we knew that we were going to need an approach that would be Alaska-focused. Native communities in different regions have such different needs and various obstacles to funding and resources. So I'm going to be looking forward to hearing how DOJ is working to support tribes across the country and in particular, how they can help address the well-documented law enforcement emergency in rural Alaska. And of course, it's also important to set up systems that require coordination across all levels of government, such as what we've done with Savannah's Act. Um, we've also got the recommendations from the Not Invisible Commission, which I was so pleased to be able to co-lead with my friend, Senator Cortez Masto. But we've got more to do to ensure proper, proper implementation of these laws and taking action on the commission's recommendations. Now is the time for continued partnerships and building accountable systems across governments. So I'm looking forward to the testimony today and the discussion with our witnesses at this very, very important hearing. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Vice Chair Murkowski, and happy birthday. Uh, Senator Cantwell. Yes, Mr. Chairman, happy birthday to the Vice Chair. I would sing, but I don't quite have the voice. <laughs> she does have a Hawaiian uh, lay on. Maybe you should try. Yeah. No. It's not my birthday. Oh. <laughs> okay. Well, anyway, I, I so appreciate uh, the senator from Alaska and her hard work on behalf of Indian uh, country and certainly on murdered and missing indigenous uh, people. So thank you. Uh, thanks for having, this is the third hearing you guys have had on law enforcement. Very much appreciate that. Uh, according to the Bureau of Indian Affairs, tribal communities need over 13,600 additional law enforcement personnel just to meet the FBI's community safe standard. So that means that many tribes do not have enough law enforcement to tackle these big problems like fentanyl or murdered and missing indigenous people. So these hearings, I think, have shown a light on the importance of passing legislation to strengthen that effort. Uh, the Yakima Nation Police Department has less than one quarter of the police officers to patrol its 1.4 million acre reservation and serve 30,000 residents, so clearly they need more support. Currently, state and federal law enforcement can provide uh, uh, retirement and other types of compensation benefits that tribes can't provide to law enforcement. And so this disparity means even though tribes have been trying to keep up, uh, we've had a great deal of problem in keeping the commissioned officers. The chief of the Tulela Police Department testified before this committee earlier this month. His department lost approximately 50% of their commissioned officers due to retirement and uh, by non-tribal jurisdiction overtime. The Kalispell tribe lost nine officers over a five-year period the same way. The Colville has struggled to keep three officers on duty per shift to patrol uh, the Colville is about basically the size of the state of Delaware, so pretty big geography to patrol. So that is why Senator Mullen and I introduced the uh, Parity for Tribal Law Enforcement Act that we discussed, S-2695. Um, and Mr. Chairman, I just appreciate 
many of us know how bad the fentanyl problem is, and part of it is uh, if you know there's not adequate law enforcement, it becomes a haven for people to locate and to try to hide production or trade of or sales of that product. So helping law enforcement will help all our communities. So thank you for this hearing. Thank you, Senator Cantwell. We'll now turn to our uh, testifiers. First, we have the Honorable Brian Newland, Assistant Secretary of Indian Affairs at the Department of Interior. We also are pleased to have the Honorable Patrice Kunesh, Commissioner at the, at the Administration for Native Americans at the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services, and Ms. Allison Randall, Pr Principal Deputy Director, Office of Violence Against Women at the United States Department of Justice. Uh, we'll remind the witnesses that we have your full testimony and it will be made part of the official record, so please keep your statements confined to five minutes or less. And with that, Assistant Secretary, uh, please proceed with your testimony. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you so much for having me back here again to testify. Ani Buju, good afternoon, Chairman Schatz and uh, Vice Chair Murkowski, uh, Mino Dabishkan, happy birthday from all of us as well. Uh, I want to thank you for the opportunity to present the department's testimony on public safety and justice in Indian country. Uh, as I say, every time I come here, the United States has a trust relationship and trust obligation to each of the 574 federally recognized tribes in our nation. All branches of our government have a trust obligation to protect the continued existence of Indian tribes and the physical safety of Indian people. Congress has commissioned many reports to investigate the public safety concerns of tribal communities, and each report reaches the same conclusion. We need to address big structural changes to guarantee the safety of people in tribal communities. The department remains committed to strengthening tribal law enforcement agencies throughout Indian country. Fulfilling our commitment requires us to increase funding, address jurisdictional complexities, and provide other much needed resources for personnel. Our 2021 Tribal Law and Order Act report to Congress estimates the total cost for public safety and justice programs in Indian country is over $3 billion. $1.7 billion is needed for law enforcement programs. $284 million is needed for existing detention facilities. And $1.5 billion is needed for tribal courts. In that same report, we explained that the BIA has spent $246 million on tribal law enforcement, $123 million for detention facilities, and $62.8 million for tribal courts. It's clear that there's a massive gap between present funding levels and our total obligation to public safety in Indian country. In FY 22 and 23, we were able to work with Congress to secure an additional $131 million for public safety and justice programs in Indian country. But even with those increases, we're still funding these programs at only 13% of our total need. In addition, 52% of that increased funding was directed by appropriations to just 16 tribes. That left only $11.5 million in additional funding to distribute across 182 tribes uh, in our nation. Utilizing our current budget, the BIA has worked to improve our law enforcement operations by focusing on recruitment cutting and cutting our attrition rate. One area where we've done that uh, is our focus on pay parity for BI law enforcement officers to ensure that they match their counterparts in other federal agencies. And we're continuing to reduce the time to hire for our own officers. And I recently appeared before this committee to support legislation that would assist the BIA in eliminating one of the biggest obstacles to recruitment, the lengthy background investigation process, and expedite the hiring of qualified law enforcement officers. Those officers must understand the complex jurisdictional issues within Indian country. Jurisdiction in Indian country depends on a matrix of the ownership status of the land and the tribal status of the individuals involved. Those issues must be resolved before an investigation can even begin. And if those issues aren't resolved, investigations can become stalled or overlooked entirely. This patchwork of jurisdiction adds transaction costs to policing in Indian country that other law enforcement agencies simply don't have to deal with. 
Now, Congress has legislated to clarify and affirm tribal jurisdiction in Indian country, including through the 2022 reauthorization of the Violence Against Women Act. VAWA has reaffirmed Indian tribes' inherent jurisdiction to prosecute non-Indians for additional crimes <clears throat> committed in Indian country. Reaffirming tribal criminal jurisdiction is consistent with the core principle of self-determination, that Indian tribes are the best situated to meet the health, welfare, and safety needs of their communities. We also ask law enforcement recruits to relocate to rural tribal communities where there is too often a lack of available housing. Poor roads generate greater wear and tear on public safety vehicles, and old communications equipment and internet service gaps put the safety of our officers at risk. Correctional facilities need to be updated or replaced, and tribal courts need to be fully staffed to ensure that their citizens are able to have justice. A number of reports commissioned by Congress have affirmed that these structural challenges make it harder to keep people safe in Indian country, and we all know what we have to do. Addressing these challenges requires coordination across the federal government with Congress and with tribal leaders, and it's a challenge we must meet. So Mr. Chairman, I wanna thank you once again for having me back here today, and I look forward to answering questions from members of the committee. Thank you very much. Uh, Ms. Kunesh, please proceed with your testimony. And pay to wash the Chairman Schatz, Vice Chair Murkowski, distinguished members of the committee, thank you for the opportunity to testify today and to offer our thoughts on behalf of the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services. My name is Patrice Kunish, and I am the Commissioner of the Administration for Native Americans. I'm also the Deputy Assistant Secretary for Native American Affairs in the Administration for Children and Families, and I serve as the Chair of the HHS Interdepartmental Council on Native American Affairs. My grandfather was born in 1902 on the Fort Berthold Reservation in North Dakota, home of the three affiliated Mandan, Hidatsa, and Arikara tribes, and he grew up on, uh, in Fort Yates on the Standing Rock Reservation. Like most Native American families at the time, he also was impacted by painful separations due to boarding schools like the Carlisle Indian Industrial Training School. At the time he was born, Native Americans were not considered citizens of the United States. And it feels remarkable that his granddaughter is now a leading a federal agency whose sole mission is to support the social and economic development of Native people and promote tribal governance and revitalization of their languages and cultures. HHS has been tackling these and many other issues head on for some time, providing a full spectrum of integrated and culturally appropriate care to the Native peoples it serves and it's deeply engaged in providing health and human services in every Native community. For example, my agency, ANA, has long provided grant funding to tribes and Native organizations that support trauma-informed services and prevention efforts, as well as culturally grounded programs such as Native languages, Indigenous art, agricultural practices, tribal code development, as well as workforce training. Even broader work is being done through our HHS partners to address consequences of violence in Indian country, much of which is highlighted in the recommendations of the Not Invisible Act Commission, or NIAC, which lays, lays out a whole of government response to the public safety crisis in Indian country. I was honored to be one of three HHS commissioners uh, on the NIAC and part of the drafting team for the report and recommendations. It's also been a privilege to partner with uh, my federal partners here, DOI and DOJ, in the interagency ICWA work group to strengthen child welfare practices across the country. ACF's work in preventing violence and human trafficking and supporting victims and survivors is guided by our ACF Missing Murdered Indigenous Peoples Action Plan. It's supported also by the Office of Trafficking in Persons, which leads national efforts to prevent trafficking and protect survivors, helping them rebuild their lives and become self-sufficient. OTIP does this through programs such as the Victims of Human Trafficking in Native Communities Development uh, Demonstration Program and the Look Beneath the Surface Campaign. 
And for 40 years, FIPSA, tribal grants, have helped tribes deliver programs that prevent family violence, domestic violence, and dating violence, and provides immediate shelter and supportive services to victims. Our Child Welfare Capacity Building Collaborative also is just one of a wide range of programs and resources provided by ACYF to address MMIP and human trafficking prevention needs of Native communities. ACF also funds four hotlines that collectively offer access to assistance and services for those impacted by MMIP and survivors of human trafficking. In addition, the Biden-Harris administration has advanced rulemaking to allow HHS and federal partners to better understand the status and experiences of children and families in Native communities and to remove institutional barriers to, that impede their well-being. Thank you for the opportunity to address the health and well-being and safety needs of our Native peoples throughout the United States. I'm happy to address your questions. Wopi Latanka. Thank you very much. Ms. Randall, please proceed with your testimony. Thank you, Chairman Schatz, Vice Chairman Murkowski, and members of the committee for inviting me to testify about public safety and justice resources in Native communities. Combating domestic violence, sexual assault, stalking, and sex trafficking by implementing the Violence Against Women Act and the recommendations of the Not Invisible Act Commission are essential to improve public safety and reduce violent crime. And that's not just because the rates of these crimes are staggering and disproportionate, though they are, it's also because reducing these crimes reduces other types of crimes. People who use violence in their communities use violence at home. And addressing the crimes of domestic and sexual violence can stop those perpetrators from committing other types of violence. This is just one crucial reason why recognizing tribes' inherent authority over non-Indian perpetrators of an expanded set of crimes was so important. And I want to thank the committee for your work to make that happen. Thanks to VAWA 2022, tribes can prosecute more crimes of domestic violence, as well as sexual violence, stalking, sex trafficking, and more. They can hold perpetrators accountable before there is a murder, before someone goes missing. Accountability is prevention. There are now at least 32 tribes exercising some type of STCJ, with 12 exercising jurisdiction over the expanded set of crimes. Just last week, we announced funding for 14 tribes under our new VAWA program to reimburse expenses incurred in exercising special tribal criminal jurisdiction, and the president's budget requests more than double last year's funding for that STCJ grant and reimbursement program. Two other crucial initiatives have been creating a framework for the pilot program for Alaska Native Villages to exercise STCJ and providing dedicated funding for any Alaska tribe to undertake activities, like updating codes or hiring prosecutors that they would need to have in place to exercise STCJ. I just returned from that convening in Fairbanks, and uh, with a boost from Senator Murkowski, we had an overflowing crowd, and I expect more Alaska tribes to take advantage of DOJ support this year. That support is desperately needed. At OVW's annual tribal consultation in 2022, Gloria George and her colleagues from the Azachizarmute tribe testified about the horrific abuse they had experienced and the need for law enforcement, housing, broadband internet, and flexible funding. And Gloria ended by saying, you know, we are here with so much hope, all of us, hoping that we make a change. When you all go back to Washington, you carry all of our hopes back with you. And then we learned that shortly before she spoke, her niece had been found murdered. But still, Gloria entrusted us with her hope. As a Not Invisible Act Commissioner, I'm proud to say that DOJ is actively working to address this crisis and respond to every NIAC recommendation within our statutory authority. We're launching a healing and response teams initiative, funding more tribal special assistant U.S. attorneys, allowing Victims of Crime Act funding to support families in, in search efforts for missing persons. And I have to say, making it easier to get and then manage federal funding was one of the most frequent requests on the NIAC committees on which I served. 
All three DOJ grant components are prioritizing this, and we're making progress. The Kinnick tribe recently told me that one of our streamlined applications was so much simpler that for the first time, they had been able to submit a complete application for an OVW grant. But there is so much more that needs to be done. And DOJ leadership and staff are committed to making that happen. Our acting associate attorney general is in New Mexico today meeting with the Pueblo of Acoma. You know, I do a lot of site visits to see firsthand what's happening on the ground in tribal and native Hawaiian communities and to build trust. And I have promised that we would keep coming back. And we are, we've even hired staff based across Indian country in Alaska. DOJ knows that the best solutions to public safety challenges come from the communities and the survivors we serve. So we will keep listening and keep asking to be held accountable for our efforts to improve. We will take that hope we were entrusted with and turn it into action. Thank you, and I welcome the opportunity to answer your questions. Uh, thank you very much. I'll start with uh, you, Ms. Randall. And, um DOJ does not officially report its staffing levels in Indian country. My staff inquired with the department and just this morning learned that 145 assistant U.S. attorneys, 25 DEA agents, and 348 FBI personnel serve Indian country, but they were unable to provide us with any um, details on vacancy rates, right? These are just funded positions, and we all know but that doesn't mean that there's a person out there doing the work. Um, in contrast, DOI has to report its staffing levels, not just the FTEs authorized and funded and the unmet needs to Congress annually. Um, I don't want to have to make a law in this space. This seems like a goofy thing to make a law about. It should be just part of our give and take where you tell us what the vacancy rates were. The word we got back from DOJ is like, we don't count that. I don't actually believe that. I think it might be a pain to figure it out, but you have to have some way to know what positions are filled and not. So can you just have, can you assure me that we're going to get fidelity on that data and that we don't actually have to make a federal law about it? Well, Senator, I can assure you that, uh, you know, increasing the resources, including staffing in Indian country and Alaska is a high priority. And we will definitely bring that concern back to the department. I, that was that was not a yes. We will do everything that we can to provide you with the information. I don't know what exactly the department has available, but we will do everything that we can, Senator. Okay. I mean, if DOI can get us vacancy rates, you guys can figure it out. It may be a database problem. Maybe you have to assign a quarter-time staffer to collate the information. But like, I'm, I don't. I do not find it acceptable that you're just going to say, like, we'll take it under advisement. This is something that the Department of Justice should know, and certainly whatever version of your HR department is aware of where the vacancies are. So it may not be that easy to just, like, run a report because maybe your software is old, but, like, you can jot it down and get back to us. You can give us a range. So I, I just need a little more of a firm commitment. You're going to get us the information that we need one way or the other? I hear that concern and the urgency, and we will get you everything that we can as quickly as we can. Okay. Um, I'm not sure what that means, but um, uh, I guess I'll just move on. Um, the OVW is doing outreach to the Native Hawaiian community, and um, we're learning more about their unique needs, particularly your work with Epic Ohana, and its focus on culturally relevant trauma-informed care. How is OVW increasing access to public safety and victim services grants for Native Hawaiian organizations like Epic Ohana? Yeah, I, I just came back um, a month or so ago from Hawaii, and we've been engaged for the last two years in really targeted outreach to the state, but specifically to Native Hawaiian serving organizations. The work that Epic Ohana does is amazing. Their Pu'uhonua Oka Ulehua is, is amazing, where they've developed a, a very specific domestic violence program within their greater work. So what we've wanted to ensure is that organizations have access to all of our funding 
funding, whether that's our tribal coalitions funding or restorative practices, culturally specific services. And to date, so far this year, our applications from organizations in Hawaii to competitive uh, discretionary grant programs has gone from the unacceptable number of one to nine. So I sincerely hope that we are making progress, Senator. Thank you. Um, Commissioner Kunesh, uh, does the ANA work with Native Hawaiian organizations to support trauma-informed services? Yes, thank you. thank you. Thank you for that question, Senator. We certainly do. And um, we have a, a, a quite a lot of Native Hawaiian organizations that we serve, one of which is the Pua, Pua'a Foundation which supports um, um, Native Hawaiians who are involved in the criminal justice system, but also have interactions um, perhaps with violence, perhaps with missing murdered indigenous, as well as human trafficking. Uh, could HRSA assist and collaborate with OVW given its role with Native Hawaiian healthcare systems? Yes, I would, uh, is that a, is that a, is that a question? That's a request for you. Yes, a request. Yes. yes, absolutely. And in fact, ANA does also support the EPIC program as well. I'm not so. tricky. I'm, I might <laughs> sometimes unpleasant, but not tricky. Um, thank you very much. Vice Chair Murkowski. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I don't know about being unpleasant. Um, uh, so, Ms. Randall, thank you for uh, going to Fairbanks to be part of the Alaska Intertribal Working group, I think um, every, every amount of engagement on the ground uh, is, is, is so much more beneficial. Um, I know for certain that you heard uh, what I hear when I am talking to uh, those who are trying to make some headway um, when it comes to uh, public safety. And uh, when we had Attorney General Barr in the state, um, his follow-on was to provide some assistance through grants. Um, we explained to Attorney General Garland when he came later that what we need, if we're gonna really do these long-term transformational changes, it hinges on flexible funding streams. I think Attorney General Garland seemed to agree with me and I think that's why he directed the Office of Tribal Justice um, and the DOJ grant-making offices to, to figure out, let's figure out what all the options are here, including legislation for improving these funding um, uh, opportunities. So the question is, is whether or not um, you are looking at uh, proposing legislation. Um, we all know that the clock is running on, on uh, advancing legislation, um, but are you considering uh, initial consultation on any legislative proposals, and and if if the answer is yes to all this, I'd I'd like to uh, I'd like to see where the direction that you're taking with any proposed legislation. The department is looking at every level from what can we do right now to improve the flexibility and, and access to our funds to what type of legislative proposals might allow us to better streamline and address you know, public safety and victim services. For any big issues, we absolutely want to consult and then, of course, work very closely with your office. Well, and again, as, as, as you're looking, if, if Legislation is going to be um, one aspect of it. Uh, if if you are in that position, we would like to to see the direction and, and some proposal before we go on the August break. We all spend a lot of time up in the state then, and knowing the direction that, that you're looking at would be important. Um, you know, when you when you think about the the frustration with competitive funding, and again the effort to try to uh, move towards formula grants. Um, DOJ's Office of, of Victim Services, OVC, Tribal Victim Service Set-Aside Program, is a good example where we have seen that you can, um, you can actually put this into place. Is there anything in statute that prevents other grant programs from being converted to formula from the competitive, uh, like OVC, C did with the tribal victims set aside, and is that is that also in your array of options that you're looking to? 
Yes, looking at how we can make these funds more easily accessible, such as through a formula, is absolutely something that we think about. We consulted on it last year, in fact, and have consulted on it before. What's the status on that consultation? Our challenge is that there was very mixed feedback from the tribes. When, Whenever you have a, a smaller pool of funding, we have less funding available than OVC, that means that there would be a number of tribes receiving incredibly small grant programs. And so uh, opinion varies widely from tribe to tribe, and there is not consensus on doing so. With additional resources, it would be easier for us to convert to a formula. OK, well, as I, again, we, we understand that you're going to have different um, uh, different perspectives that are going to influence one way or another. I'm, I'm, I'm trying to make sure that as you are, are taking these initial steps, again, there is a sharing of, of information back and forth. I wanted to uh, ask you, Sec Assistant Secretary um, Newland, in my opening comments, I noted that we had directed the BIA um, to conduct consultation on the budgetary needs in PL 280 states for tribal law enforcement. You're supposed to report back on the available funding. Can you share with me the timeline for your consultations as we've directed in the interior bill um, and kind of where you are with that? Uh, thank you, Madam Vice Chair. I don't have uh, that information for you this afternoon. I could uh, likely get you an answer to that by tomorrow morning. All right. Are you... Are, are you participating in the Alaska Intertribal Work Group meetings um, as as they advance as, as part of Interior? I am not, no. But is somebody within Interior part of that? Uh, I will have to get back to you, Madam Vice Chair. I apologize. I don't have that information. Well, no, I, I, I get it, and I understand that. But I'm I'm just looking at, at there's, there's so much intersect, there's so much interplay mm -hmm. between Department of Justice, Department of Interior, and Department of Health and Social Services. And we can't have DOJ over here not talking and intersecting with what Interior and, and, and DHS is. And so it's a little bit of cross-pollination that is going to allow us to leverage all uh, of this. So um, I would I would hope that it's not just when we bring you together for an oversight hearing that you're learning more about what's going on, but that this is actually happening interagency, interdepartment. And Madam Vice Chair, I, I can tell you that we do uh, collaborate not only with Ms. Randall's office um, at DOJ, uh, weekly uh, and monthly meetings uh, with our counterparts at the department on the criminal justice and law enforcement side. Um, that's a that's something that's a priority. And, and Madam Vice Chair, if I may, just on the the flexibility for funding to emphasize that, that the president has issued an executive order uh, to uh, uh, direct all federal agencies to make uh, act, tribal access to funding and, and grants uh, more flexible, um, and and direct all of us as agencies to uh, work to streamline that process and make sure that funds are available to tribes. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Senator Cortez Masto. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman and, and our ranking member for all the great work you're doing in this space. Uh, Ms. Randall, I'm going to take advantage of having you in front of me from DOJ to ask you a couple questions that I need uh, clarification from because it's, it's hard to, as you can tell, get answers from the U.S. Attorney's offices at times. Here's my challenge. Um, in your testimony, you highlight that the DOJ's MMIP regional outreach program staff is assisting U.S. attorney's offices in updating and refining their Savannah's Act guidelines. Um, the DOJ response to the Not Invisible Act Commission report states that all U.S. attorney's offices and federal judicial districts with tribal lands have established guidelines. I need verification that, one, Every single U.S. Attorney's Office across this country has established those guidelines. And then two, I want verification that they actually have assigned staff to focus, not just in AUSA, but the FBI and anyone else within DOJ to focus on uh, this work. I can't get those answers, but I, I want, I kind of want clarification here. I worked as a AUSA here in Washington, D.C. office. Is it still set up that the Associate Attorney General 
overseas programs, including your office of violence against women. Is that correct? Is it still? Or is yes. It okay. And then the deputy attorney general uh, oversees a separate division that includes the U.S. attorney's office, DEA, and FBI. Is that still set up the same way? Yes. So the associate attorney general has nothing to do with the FBI, the U.S. attorney's office, or uh, the DEA, but the deputy attorney general does, correct? The deputy attorney general also oversees broadly our work. Right. But the associate attorney general, associate attorney general does not. No, though they so do meet. So you cannot sit here and guarantee to us that there will be that connection and oversight and information uh, because you have to go back to the deputy attorney general to get this information, correct? Well, some information I have, such as that every U.S. attorney with tribal obligations has had their Savannah's Act guidelines in place since 2022, and they are, of course, meant to be living documents that those U.S. attorneys' offices must consult and continue. They all have not just AUSAs, but they have a So you have liaison. that information, but you don't have the information on how many have been assigned to focus in this area from AUSAs, FBI, and DEA. I apologize that I don't have all the information. Well, and, and I'm not putting you on the spot. In other words, maybe you're not entitled to have that. Maybe you shouldn't have that. Maybe it should be in another area of DOJ. But that's the an those are the answers we want. And if you're not the right person, then maybe we need the deputy here to, to answer those questions. Because this is my challenge all along. Listen, I, 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 I can't say this and stress this enough. As somebody who worked in, in, in the U.S. Attorney's Office, but also in the state of Nevada, worked um, as the Attorney General, working with our tribal communities, working with BIA, working with the FBI, working with the U.S. Attorneys, I also know that not every single U.S. Attorney's Office focuses in this space, nor do they assign enough staff. Now, with that said, it may be that they are understaffed and under-resourced. I know the BIA is, because I talked to BIA agents in Nevada. Their geographic territory is ridiculous, and there's very few of them. But there's very few AUSAs assigned, and FBI agents as well. So this is the information we need if we are going to provide the support for the resources that you need to address all of these issues that we are now uh, asking you to take a look at through Savannah's Act and Non-Invisibles Act. So uh, that's what I want to pull from you is that if anything you take back, please take it back to the top management, DOJ. We just need answers. We want to work together, but we need answers to some of these questions because I am tired of hearing from my tribal communities, and rightfully so, that they're just not getting any support. Not every tribal community in my state has the ability um, to have law enforcement. So they do have to re rely uh, on federal partners, and they're just not there all the time. And I can't get answers as to why DOJ is not there. So it, please take that back. I'm going to jump to um, uh, um, uh, our, our Assistant Secretary, Newland. Thank you for, for being here. Can you talk a little bit about uh, in, in BIA's Missing and Murdered Unit it provides critical criminal justice services for MMIP. The DOI's response to the Not Invisible Act Commission report highlights that shortages of BIA law enforcement can lead to missing and murdered unit personnel to be temporarily reassigned to other public safety needs. At the time of the report response in March 2024, DOI stated that only 32 of the 66 positions nationwide within the missing and murdered unit were actually filled. So can you t address that? What progress has DOI made to staffing these 34 remaining positions? Thank you, Senator. I'll just uh, briefly, if I can, uh, Mr. Chairman, with the time. Uh, we have added some staff. Uh, we have had just a persistent problem in our, our hiring process of uh, really breaking through uh, in adding, you know, getting close to full staffing, both within the MMU and across OJS um, nationwide. Uh, the uh, pay parity initiative has helped uh, slow or, or stall our attrition rate within BI law enforcement. It has made some improvements around the margin. Uh, I do think additional uh, changes uh, are needed, as I testified at, at the recent hearing. Uh, so we've added some additional staff to the MMU, uh, but we are not uh, we are not close to full staffing yet, and that that is something that we're putting a lot of emphasis on uh, with our human capital team uh, and looking for levers that we can pull um, where we have authority right now. So is it? And I know I'm going over my time, but just so I understand, is it not? It's not for lack of having the people that are interested in in, in the job. It is the challenges with with pay 
mm-hmm. and other challenges that it is being it addressed, is, background checks. It is it, it is an all, all of the above, Senator. It's okay. it's a matter of recruitment, uh, but it's also a challenge. Uh, you know, getting folks hired in a timely manner. Uh, we're competing against state, cities, and counties uh, for police officers as well, uh, and it, it, it's it's frustrating. But it is a it is a point of emphasis for us. Thank you, Senator Rounds. Thank you, Chairman Schatz and Vice Chair Murkowski, and thank you to our witnesses for taking the time to attend today's hearing. Residents of tribal communities on the Northern Plains are experiencing a public safety crisis. According to recent crime data, numerous tribes are encountering violent crime rates five times higher than the U.S. national average. In the last year, three tribal governments in the state of South Dakota have declared a state of emergency in response to public safety threats. With low personnel numbers and high number of calls for assistance, tribal law enforcement officers often struggle to respond to emergencies in a timely manner. One tribal law enforcement agency in South Dakota relies on a total of three officers per shift to patrol over 1.6 million acres of land. In response to the police shortages, some residents of tribal communities have even resorted to establishing citizen patrols to look out for crime. Criminal entities are taking note of the lack of manpower and are directly targeting reservation communities. As a result, tribal law enforcement officers are encountering higher volumes of illegal drugs, including fentanyl. I look forward to hearing ways that the witnesses believe the federal government can help improve law enforcement services in Indian country, especially as tribal members continue to deal with serious threats to public safety. Um, Let me just close by saying that, that tribal members from South Dakota are frustrated, really deeply frustrated by the inaction of the Department of the Interior. Uh, Look, I really appreciate the fact that the chairman and the vice chair have held this really important hearing today and and provided us with an opportunity for some oversight. And I just, uh, you know, I've got just a few questions that I wanted to ask, and I'm going to begin, if I could, with um, Assistant Secretary Newland. Um, As you know, the majority of prospective tribal officers, including direct service and 638 officers, are required to receive training at the Indian Police Academy in Artesia, New Mexico. According to several tribal leaders, this distance has hampered recruitment efforts uh, on the Northern Plains. On April 3rd, I had sent a letter uh, specifically about this particular issue uh, to you. Um, And I'm just curious, uh, 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 Secretary Nolan, will you commit to exploring possible alternative training options on the Northern Plains? It, It is my hope that not only would you consider that, but you would agree to meet with us and see if we can't find a path forward so that we can actually fill the law enforcement mm. positions that we can't fill today. Thank you, Senator. Uh, I would be uh, happy to work with anyone who wants to help us address these challenges. I, I will note um, that uh, uh, the BI uh, law enforcement accepts uh, people as recruits who have completed uh, state uh, academy training, so long as it's supplemented with the appropriate uh, federal training uh, that is required to become a BI law enforcement agent. And I think that's part of the problem, is that even after they've done the, the local law enforcement training, they're still required to leave and to go to basically Artesia in order to get training. And in doing so, we're losing qualified candidates. So once again, I'm, I'm just simply, I think there's an opportunity here, and I know the state of South Dakota has offered to assist in training, but most certainly, if they still have to leave, we're going to lose those officers. I, but I, I just ask, would you try to work with us to find an alternative path to get the same types of training that right now we're not able to get and, and keep these uh, these officers, you know, in, in with our tribes? Absolutely, Senator. Th- thank you. And then also, Assistant Secretary Newland, in, in the last two years, several tribal leaders have asked the BIA for additional resources mm-hmm. to deal with the uptick in serious crime. This has included requests for increased funding and personnel. When a tribal law enforcement agency is encountering significant threats to public safety, does the BIA offer 
Any emergency resources to officers on the ground? That's a, a thank you question, or thank you, Senator. That's a tough question. And it goes back to uh, uh, Senator Cortez Masto's question. Uh, right now, we're in a position where when there is an emergency or a crisis on the ground, that if we have to detail officers, we're taking them out of a community uh, where they're already understaffed as well. So uh, what we've proposed, including the president's FY25 budget, is additional funding to help us uh, address this issue nationwide. I, I just want to note that the, the president's budget would allow us to add uh, 222 additional federal and tribal law enforcement officers across the country with the 198 tribes and, and uh, uh, locations that we fund. So that's, that's our best bet for a long-term solution. Otherwise, uh, we're pulling detailing officers out and then uh, we hear uh, justifiable uh, criticism and concern from uh, tribal leaders in those communities when we're moving officers out to address a crisis elsewhere. Well, thank you. Mr. Chairman, thank you for the time to, to, to be able to ask these questions. I don't think this is just in the Northern Plains. I think this is across a large swath of, of Indian country, and I think we really have to get back in and take a look at whether or not the resources that are provided and that those additional resources that are being offered uh, if we can streamline the process to get this back down to the tribes, boots on the ground, see if we can't find a way so that these individuals that are coming in and right now are being required to leave their homes and communities for six months or more for training, if we can't get that done more in a more local area where we can actually get them to get on the job and then to be able to stay on the job. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Senator Rounds. Uh, Assistant Secretary Newland, um, you previously testified that 23 of the 96 detention centers in Indian Country are in poor condition, and replacing them will cost at least $590 million. But the president's budget only requests $156 million. Why the delta? Uh, that's a that's a tough question, Chairman. Uh, I know our uh, our proposed budget in FY25 would add. Uh, over $30 million for new construction, which would allow us to replace, on average, about one uh, facility. Uh, this is something that we're working to add money to. I'll just note, if I may, Mr. Chairman, that if you look at the Tribal Law and Order Act report, the three categories where, where we note that we're falling short with police officers, courts, and detention, the area where we're the closest, actually, right now, is, is full funding for detention. But that that excludes construction. Uh, so if you were to add construction on top of that, the, the Tribal Law and Order Act would show about a $730 million. So what's the, five, what's the 590 repair? Pardon? What does the $590 million represent if it's not construction? It's, it's R and Repair and replacement. Okay. Re repair and replacement. So some yeah. construction. No, just not new build. Well, that w I'm sorry to be, uh, I don't mean to. I think your person you. is nodding, so yes. maybe that's right. <laughs> <laughs> Some construction, correct. Okay. Um, thank you for that. Um, I'll just note that 16 of the 23 poor condition jails are located in um, states represented by members of the Senate Committee on Indian Affairs. So this is something that we ought to work together on on a, on a bipartisan uh, basis. Um, Ms. Randall, increasing the number of tribal special assistant U.S. attorneys is one of the not invisible act uh, recommendations or act the commission's recommendations. DOJ agreed with the commission in its response, but the president's budget only requests flat funding for this program, $3 million. Bucks. Um, this seems to me to be a really inexpensive way to um, uh, have a greater law enforcement presence and you know, I, I understand resource constraints and I understand it's like a tough question. Why you say this is so important? Why? And your real answer is, well, OMB didn't let me, right? I understand what happens here. But three million for this very important um, uh, uh, approach that will make just such an outsized difference. Um, I really think we have to, you know, kind of rethink um, how we deploy our resources here to the extent that we all cared about the Not Invisible Act and we were anxious to hear their recommendations and they kind of came up through a real process, right, that we're all pretty proud of. Now it's time to do the things that they're saying we should do and three million bucks is not going to get it done. Can, can we work together to sort of increase the resources in this space 
and 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 get the DOJ sort of full throatedly behind not just the funding aspect but the implementation. We would be delighted to work together to increase resources. If I may, just one example, the Mississippi Band of Choctaw with, uh, with their Tribal Sousa Award, they brought some of the first federal prosecutions stemming from the reservation. The first ever habitual domestic violence offender indictment and, and a homicide case. And they have received and accepted over 90 vow cases and prosecuted 30 so far, just this tribal AUSA. So this is something that we think could be very successful. My understanding is there's something called the Monaco Doctrine, which basically encourages the D encourages D uh, DOJ to um, uh, the Monaco Memo, excuse me, that encourages DOJ to to use this technique. Um, so I'm just hope I'm I'm sure she's not necessarily just staring at a screen watching a, 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 a an oversight hearing, but I'd like for you to communicate back that we want full implementation of this idea, which is hey, if we deputize folks. We can have a bigger law enforcement presence, and um, and so I'm so excited about this idea, and I'm so frustrated at the what, what I would consider the lackluster implementation. But this is a the good thing about this one is it's a solvable problem. Um, Senator Danes, are you ready, or should I go to Senator Murkowski? I'm ready. Okay, Senator Danes. Chairman Schatz, thank you, Vice Chairman Murkowski. Happy birthday, thank you. and uh, thanks for the opportunity to discuss public safety in native communities. You know, each time I meet with tribal leaders across Montana, law enforcement has become their number one priority. Indian country is in crisis. Tribal leaders I've spoken with have told me they feel like they're at war. That's the word being used to describe what's happening. Multiple reservations in Montana have declared a state of emergency in response to the massive influx of fentanyl and meth flowing in from the southern border. Cartel members are operating with impunity on reservations. They're embedding themselves in the community. They're exploiting the lack of law enforcement resources in some of the jurisdictional gaps we see in Indian country. In fact, according to our attorney general in Montana, his office, fentanyl seizures are up 11,000% since 2019. Montana's tribal communities are ground zero for this destruction. And you don't always think about Montana being a border state. You think of maybe a Canadian border state. But you look at the way the logistics system works the just very short amount of time it takes from that fentanyl to get from where the cartels produce it in Mexico across the southern border into Montana in a matter of 48 hours. While the cartels operate unchecked, violent crime, crimes against women, crimes against children, and human trafficking are happening more frequently as this influence spreads. I was proud to introduce a resolution to designate May 5th as the National Day of Awareness for Missing and Murdered Native Women and Girls, so it brings much needed attention to this issue. However, there is much more work to be done to address the MMIW crisis and all crime that's going on in Indian country. The BIA, alongside federal partners like the DEA and the FBI, have a responsibility to enforce the law and protect our tribal communities. Assistant Secretary Newland, the vast majority of tribal law enforcement agencies operate under 638 self-determination contracts and self-governance compacts, including several in Montana. These agreements maximize tribal sovereignty and tribal autonomy by allowing the tribe to police their own communities and use resources as they see fit. But I am concerned that the funding is not being appropriately allocated to tribes that enter into the 638 arrangements with the BIA. Tribal governments from Northern Cheyenne, 
Fort Belknap, have sued the BIA over stagnant and inadequate 638 funding for law enforcement activities. And the Northern Cheyenne saw an increase in funding as a result of those suits. Tribes shouldn't have to take the BIA to court to squeeze out more resources to serve their communities. I hear from our tribes in Montana that funding for 638 contracts is too low, never gets raised, and is much lower than the funding provided to run similar BIA programs. Here's my question. What specific measures did the BIA have in place to ensure that transparency and accountability in the decision-making process for tribes that fund law enforcement programs to these 638 agreements? Thank you, Senator. I appreciate that question. And, and I've had the opportunity to spend time up at, at Northern Cheyenne, I, I think, as um, we've shared with you. The, the 638 process uh, uh, for any program, but with law enforcement um, is at the BIA is, is fairly transparent. One of the one of the challenges that we have is with our with the funding that we have, we cannot reduce funding for some tribes as as new tribes uh, or as tribes uh, take on new contracts. And so we've got to use the funding that we have. And, and as I was uh, explaining in my uh, prepared uh, oral statement, uh, you know, we saw some funding increases for law enforcement for Indian Affairs in 22 and 23. But when you when you dive into those increases, only eleven million dollars of those increases was available to to increase the funding uh, nationwide. So we had eleven million dollars in new funds to to spread across one hundred eighty two tribes. And I know this is a a, a concern uh, I've heard directly uh, through the Tribal Interior Budget Committee. We've walked tribal leaders through how this funding gets from the appropriation stage. Uh, into tribal accounts through 638 uh, contracts. And I would be happy to, to um, have our team meet with your staff, Senator, to, to walk them through that as well. But um, I, I very much want to get more funding out uh, to tribes to address these issues, and I think everyone here agrees. I'm out of time. Uh, um, thanks for visiting and engaging our tribes on the ground. I think that's really, really important because uh, you all you know, sometimes feel like you're a long ways away, uh, which you are physically speaking, geographically speaking, but uh, you know, our, our tribes are exasperated. And the 638 program empowers them to kind of take really control of their destiny. And I just hope you do all you can to make sure they are resourced appropriately because, I mean, this is literally life and death situation going on in Indian country. Great. Thank you, Senator. Thanks, Mr. Chairman. Senator Smith. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair and Vice Chair, and thanks all of our um, panelists. It's nice to see uh, you again, especially my friend uh, Commissioner Quinish from Minnesota. Um, so thank you. Um, I, you know, I'm, I think in a way I'm following up on what Senator Danes is raising as he's talking about 638 authority and um, how we can create a better system for tribes to be able to exercise their inherent authority uh, to provide public safety on uh, tribal lands. And we have heard so often about this sort of revolving door that occurs um, when non-native people come onto tribal land, commit um, horrible crimes, arrested, then they're released, and then it happens over and over again. So I'm going to start with you, Ms. Randall. Can you briefly tell me why do you think it is that federal prosecution rates are so low? Um, federal prosecution rates are so low on Indian in Indian country. Well, federal prosecutions are essential, and as you know, this is a, a top priority for the Deputy Attorney General, who has who has said that uh, that this is a not just a, a top priority overarchingly for the department, but that we must bring every charge that we can. Um, her memo says that these offenses should be investigated wherever credible evidence of a violation of federal law exists, and offenses should be prosecuted when the department's principles of federal prosecution are met. And at the Office on Violence Against Women, we are hoping to help um, reduce the declination of meritorious cases wherever they may be. These cases can be really hard to prosecute, whether you're federal, state, or local. So we just on Monday released a, a framework to help prosecutors um, you know, really successfully bring, for example, domestic violence and sexual assault cases. Okay. 
Um, so I think I'm going to just... Um, so you're acknowledge the, 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 the prosecution rates are not what they should be, not what they could be, and you're working to improve them. And I think we would maybe agree that one of the challenges we have are some of these, as we discussed earlier, some of the jurisdictional issues that make it difficult and complicated, as you were saying, um, um, Secretary Newland, to make these prosecutions. Um, I happen to think that I don't really know that we're doing enough in Congress. I think that we know that the best solutions for Indian country are going to come from Indian country, and this is especially true in public safety, and we've learned this, right, from the special tribal criminal jurisdiction that we're creating, that we have created um, in response to missing and murdered indigenous women and relatives. So I know that many of us are committed to working on this, um, on this committee. I believe, as I said, that I don't think that we've done enough. Um, Assistant Secretary Newland, could you address this? What in your experience as a tribal leader and as Assistant Secretary has sort of shown you about what is working about this special, um, uh, this special tribal criminal jurisdiction? Thank you, Senator. About the, I'm sorry, just to understand your question. What's working about the the VAWA jurisdiction? Yes, I mean, what are we learning from this experience that we might be able to apply to other circumstances where similar special jurisdictions might help us to get better prosecution rates? Well, I think, Senator, it's just the it's the the core the core principle of self determination, which you were alluding to, is that tribes are able to, uh, you know, be first responders uh, mm -hmm. to public safety concerns and. Uh, you know, U.S. attorneys, uh, we we know, handle just an enormous caseload. Uh, and so it, it makes it difficult uh, to uh, uh, for them to get to all of these cases in a timely manner um, that tribal prosecutors and tribal courts um, just don't have to deal with because, because they're local. Mm -hmm. And I've had the chance to visit some communities that are exercising that jurisdiction, like Pasquayaki in Arizona, um, and see what they've been able to do uh, with their courts and their law enforcement agency. It's it's incredible. Yes, uh, they're getting great yeah. getting great results. Yes, yes, yes. I think that's right. I think I think that there are really important lessons to be learned. And as you said, the most important one of them is that if we recognize tribes' inherent authority to be able to provide for public safety on their um, in their nations, that we get better results for all the reasons that you outlined. And um, uh, Mr. Chair and Vice Chair and all members of the committee, I think this is something that we can do some more work on. Um, we've learned a lot from what we've um, accomplished with the special tribal jurisdiction um, with VAWA, and we should be looking at other ways that we can do this and um, other ways that we can extend this knowledge to prosecuting, for example, drug um, crimes as well. So I look forward to working with my colleagues on this. I think that there's more we can do. Senator Hoven. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thanks to both you and the uh, Ranking Member Mikowski for calling this uh, hearing on um, safety, uh, on the uh, public safety on the reservations. It, it, it's just incredibly important. And, uh, thanks to all of our witnesses for being here. I, I really think that the key is we've got to get more law enforcement officers out there on the ground. Uh, BIA is, is coming nowhere near to filling the positions uh, that they have available, and we've got to do more to get those positions filled. Um, right now, uh, according uh, to the testimony received by this committee, there's a 39%, almost 40% vacancy rate for all positions in the BIA Office of, of uh, Justice Services. So uh, one of the things, Senator Cortez, Masto and I have introduced the Bridging Agency Data Gaps and Ensuring Safety, or Badges Act, uh, to try to expedite getting more officers into these positions. That would allow BIA to uh, basically a pilot uh, program to conduct their own background checks to try to expedite that service. But uh, we've got to recruit and train more agents. And of course, that's why we started the advanced, uh, the advanced training center at uh, Camp Grafton. Uh, we have the program at Artesia, which you're all very well familiar with. But you know, we have an incredible, we have an even higher vacancy rate in the Northern Great Plains, and part of it is proximity, just getting people recruited and going to these schools. And of course, it was harder to get them to go down to New Mexico, and then if they did, to come back to the Northern Great Plains. So that was the whole concept. And I mean, it's working, but we gotta do more. For the, uh, the last data I have is that uh, in 2021, BIA put tw uh, almost 5,500 uh, people through the law enforcement uh, and public safety training programs 
5,429, of those 3,920, so of the about 5,500, almost 4,000, uh, went through the, uh, the advanced training center. But we, we've got to do more. We've got a 40% uh, vacancy rate. I brought this up to Secretary of Interior Holland, and you'll be uh, pleased to know, um, Secretary Holland, that she Newland, that she identified you as the guy I should talk to. So I'm talking to you. So tell me, what can we do uh, to get more people through uh, our teacher too, but certainly through the advanced training center and, sure. and get these positions filled? Sure. Thank you, Senator. I think uh, uh, I'd be happy to, to make sure we get the, the BIA's vacancy rate um, in the record. I, before this hearing, we went and checked. It was, uh, it, it was, it was not... 40%, it was closer, it was 30 or, or just under 30. Okay. But we, it, not, not where we want to be, certainly. I'm not. Uh, North Dakota, we're authorized for 256, and we've got about 81. So, I okay. mean, in the northern Great Plains, it's higher. Yeah, I agree, Senator. With, with respect to training, uh, would, would love to find ways, as I uh, indicated to Senator Rounds, would love to find ways to to come up with all kinds of solutions on the recruitment and retention. and was honored to come and support the Badges Act a few weeks ago before the committee. Thank you for that. We'll be happy to work with you on training opportunities. Yeah, let's make this a priority. I mean, there's a lot of things we need to do out there. But having more law enforcement on the ground, and particularly where we, we can get folks to come from their home area and go back to their home area, you know, that makes a, that makes a big difference. Everything from role model to understanding and knowing the people and all those things. And so we, we've just got to do better at recruiting, getting more people this training and, and getting them uh, back on, uh, on the ground. So that, that, that has to be a priority, and, and my office will work with you as, you know, as, however we can accomplish that. The other thing I want to bring up is the SURVIVE Act. Essentially, the point of that was to have a 5% set of, tribal set aside for the Crime Victim Fund. And so I want to ask uh, uh, Director Randall, um, are you tracking tribal specific? I mean, the whole idea was to make sure we help you fund uh, tribal uh, victim services. Are you tracking that? How is it going? Uh, what's working, what's not, what are your recommendations to improve it? Well, um, on behalf of my colleagues at the Office of Victims of Crime, I can say they are working so hard to ensure that funds get to tribes. Um, you know, they allow a, an interview process to complete an application. They've, they've gone out to Alaska, you know, and on the ground even interviewed people to, uh, to reach those funds. So I know that they are doing everything possible to make sure that those dollars get into the hands of the tribes. Do you have any specific recommendations on what else we can do to help victims and make the program more effective? Overarchingly, the Victims of Crime Act Fund is incredibly successful, faces some uh, funding challenges, as you well know. So I, I know that there are proposals before Congress to continue to support the health of the Crime Victims Fund. You know, when I'm out in the field talking with organizations, they tell me how much they depend on those Victims of Crime Act funds. Good. Okay. Again, thanks to all of you for being here. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Senator Lujan. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, Director Randall, last month, other members of this committee and I sent a letter to the Department of Justice on declination rates in Indian country, which in 2021 stood at 18%. I appreciate that agency staff briefed us on this matter, but I fully expect a written response to all seven questions in my letter. Will you make sure that I get those responses in writing? Senator, I presume that we can get you and Mr. Schatz all of the, uh, all of the answers in writing for everything that we have available. I like yes and no's. Is <laughs> the answer yes or no? Well, I don't work on those, so I can't say yes. We'll absolutely be taking it back to my colleagues at the Office of I Legislative Affairs. I appreciate that, Affairs. Ms. Randall. Look, I, Mr. Chairman, if I may, please. this notion of the line of questioning that you asked for from the administration to get data back should not take a subpoena. We're talking about the life and safety of people that have been getting killed and murdered and have been ignored. Nobody sees them. Nobody goes in. We see declination rates with prosecution. And the best that we can get to getting answers to this from the United States Department of Justice is 
Let me look at this. Let me think about this. That's not how the administration should work with the legislative branch in, in the United States Senate. I don't understand this. I'm going to maybe get back to my line of questioning so that I can lower my blood pressure, Mr. Chairman. Let me but I just don't understand why it's so hard to get a yes or no on. We're going to give you what we got. The staff were answering questions. I want them in writing so we can hold people accountable. Senator Lujan, um, you wrote a letter to the Department of Justice, and they owe you members from this sub, and they they owe you an answer in writing. My question, just to be fair, my question was about data collection, and I'm a, I was assuming that Ms. Randall was hedging a little bit because she doesn't know exactly what data exists. I found it irritating, but at least explainable. But when a member reduces to writing a question or a series of questions, it is not, I presume we will get back to you, but we will get back to you. There is a difference between the thing I was asking for and the thing Senator Lujan was asking for. I am certain that we will be getting back to you in writing. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. The Department of Justice is required under the Tribal Law and Order Act to submit a yearly report to Congress on Indian country investigations and prosecutions. Is that one of your responsibilities? That is not one of my responsibilities, Senator. The last time the Department of Justice published covered data from, was from 2021. Are you familiar with this requirement through the Department of Justice? Yes, I have uh, looked at that report. Have you, has, has anyone shared with you when Congress might get the next report since the last one we received was of uh, information going back to 2021? If I'm correct, it's 2024 now. Uh, yes, Senator, that is in clearance right now. So, the, so soon? Soon. So I'll assume as soon we'll get that information. I appreciate that. Um, Assistant Secretary Newland, I, I've heard from several uh, Pueblos and leaders in New Mexico um, when there's efforts to try to cross commission uh, tribal police, BIA officers with uh, sheriff's offices or things of that nature, that it cannot be secured uh, because of concerns of liability or things of that nature. I'm assuming from the local law enforcement agencies that there's a, a, a limited liability for cross-commissioning of BIA or tribal officers. So the question that I have for you is, yes or no, are BIA 638 tribal law enforcement officers and other justice staff covered under the Federal Tort Claims Act for liability purposes? Are BIA officers? Yes. Are 638 tribal law enforcement officers? I believe so. I can confirm uh, afterwards. And Justice Half, I'm, the reason I'm interested here, if maybe we can, I'll submit that in writing, is I want to provide assurance to the local law enforcement agencies in New Mexico that in fact there is coverage because I shared the same concern that Mr. Hoven was just raising and that members of this committee have been raising in the lower numbers of law enforcement in communities. And when I was younger, I, I remember cross-commissioning being an important tool, and there was more of a presence where everyone was working to keep communities safer. I, I felt safer. I'm concerned now if there's um, some rationale that reduces that. So I'm hoping that we can provide that certainty going forward, and if there is anything missing um, in tort law, that maybe it's something we could consider, find some bipartisan solutions to this, and, and see if we can help uh, in this particular area. We, we can get that to you, Senator. I, I appreciate it very much. Thank you, Chairman. Thank you, Senator Lujan. Vice Chair Murkowski. Thank you. Um, at the end of my a round of questioning, um, I had asked or I had encouraged that there be this cross-pollination amongst agencies. And, and, and one of the things that we know is that programs that may work in one department are models that we should be looking to. And so in that vein, um, when we think about the... Uh, uh, the 477 program that authorizes tribes to, to consolidate federal funding from across all the federal agencies into, into one more streamlined program for, for, uh, that's designed by the tribes. Uh, we see how that works. Uh, we're aware that DOJ, DOJ recently transferred to DOI two discretionary grant programs um, as proposed by a tribe, and these were the OVC, Tribal Victim Service Set-Aside, and, and VAWA funds. Um, 
we saw that in a letter to the chair of the House Natural Resources Committee, DOJ stated that the department has con concluded that, quote, in this circumstance, to transfer to interior uh, funds under the two discretionary grant programs. So, uh, Director Randall, do you agree that the Department of the Interior has the authority to integrate programs into a 477 plan um, as, as mandated under that law? Do you think that we've got that ability to do that? Yes, Senator. Um, following 477 is very important to us and something that the department fully supports. You know, the Violence Against Women Act has a lot of very specific mandates, and my office has not yet consulted on how for tribal communities who are, who are implementing VAWA this will play out. So we're looking forward to some continued dialogue at consultation, and I believe the National Congress of American Indians Violence Against Women Task Force will also be having a listening session very soon. Well, and again, we think, uh, again, the efficiencies that are created, we've seen them um, in play, and, and that's what we're looking for here as well. In another area, uh, this relates to um, uh, technical assistance. Um, one of the things that, uh, that uh, Attorney General Garland had heard about, um, or we had raised with him, was this desire to ensure that there's culturally appropriate uh, technical assistance that is available to the tribes. Because I've heard from, from some tribes who are accessing OVW funding that every program has a different technical assistance provider. Um, sometimes these providers have zero um, Alaska expertise. The, uh, the FIPSA office, though, has provided funding to Alaska Native Women's Resource Center to provide comprehensive technical assistance to tribes and tribal organizations since 2017. It works. This is a model that is comprehensive, it's flexible uh, TA to the tribes in our state, and, and, and people know that this is something that, that can work. So I guess the, the ask is, is, is whether OVW can look to the successful implementation of, of what FIPSA office at HHS has done and, and, and pattern this. We need technical assistance for uh, tribes and tribal organizations that really works. Not just you call them, but you can't get anywhere. So again, I'm encouraging the, uh, the intersect here between your departments and your agencies. Absolutely, and we have funded the Alaska Native Women's Resource Center uh, recently for some Alaska-wide technical assistance um, in addition to our awards for Alaska-specific special tribal criminal jurisdiction assistance. And you know, while the VAWA programs are incredibly diverse, covering a, a huge range of professionals, it's essential to us that that cultural specificity be there. When responses are culturally specific, they're significantly more effective. So we're committed to continuing to work on this. Well, and sometimes it's easier to, to have somebody uh, be that assistance in some community somewhere else in America where they have no idea that they're speaking to people who um, have no way out of a village, there's no road, uh, the weather is down, and, and, and no resources, no shelter. And I think what we've seen uh, through FIPSA, I think, is a good model and I would, I would commend you to that. Last question is, is for you, uh, Assistant Secretary Newland. Uh, our tribes are exploring some different ways to set up intertribal appellate court systems um, in Alaska and, and regional courts. And um, uh, we often work, you're very familiar with the tribal consortia throughout the state, an exercise of self-determination throughout. But if tribes in a region want assistance through the PL-280 tribal court program to set up a regional court, and the consortia then has a resolution that designates that authority from each member tribe. Um, are you able to fund the consortia's request? And if not, you know, share with me what obstacles there may be to that approach, because as you well know, economies of scale in so many of these areas are so important to this, the success of any program out there when you have these very, very small villages, uh, again, who are kind of operating in a very independent way. So are we okay with the consortium model and being able to fund them that way? 
Madam Vice Chair, we, uh, it, so long as there are, are tribal governments that agree to it, we ought to be. Mm -hmm. I don't want to misspeak here in, in the committee and, and, and say yes if the, if the answer is no, because I know you would want to help solve that. So if I, if I can follow up with an answer, uh, I'd be happy to get that to your team in writing. I think your team behind you is oh. like nodding okay. affirmatively. They're telling me yes, they know. They know. Okay. <laughs> Well, good. Well, you, you make sure that he gets all of that positive uh, encouragement there. Um, because, again, this is what we're trying to do. We're trying to build some efficiencies, but that efficiency is going to come when we leverage the resources of everybody. And so I cannot underscore enough how important this is for Department of Justice Department of Health and Social Services, Department of Interior, and all the agencies and all the folks underneath as we're working to build out a model that is unique to our region, unique to our state, working with different, different constructs than you're going to have from anybody else that's sitting up at this dais. Please work with us, be with us, come to this state. We got Lots of space for you this summer and even more during the winter. So um, uh, thank you for the, the effort. And Mr. Mr. Um, Chairman, I think it's significant for this committee to have had the level of participation that we have had on this issue. We've all raised different things, but we all kind of come back to the same thread. Limited resources, what are we doing to make sure that we are leveraging them and... Um, uh, the need is just too great. Thank you, Vice Chair Murkowski, and again, happy birthday. Um, if there are no more questions for our witnesses, members may also submit written follow-up questions for the record. The hearing record will be open for two weeks. I want to thank all of the witnesses for their time and their testimony, and this hearing is adjourned. Thank you.